All right, everybody, I just thought it'd be a good idea to um, kind of give a brief introduction to the architecture of PGXN so you get to know a bit more about it and how it fits into the overall Postgres ecosystem. Uh, feel free to ask questions or poke at me whenever you like. I'll try to, note, I think I'll notice stuff here. I haven't done Zoom in a while, so we'll see. So uh, anyway, let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of the components in the PGXN architecture today. One is the meta spec, which defines uh, the metadata that gets put into distributions. There's the PGXN manager, which is responsible for managing the uploads and, and users. There's the root mirror, which is where all the data is stored canonically for the system. <clears throat> There's a search API and extended uh, additional API. Uh, there's the site itself. Uh, there is a command line client, actually a couple of them. And there are some CICD tools. So I'm going to take them in that order. So <clears throat> got the meta spec. Uh, the PTXN meta spec was inspired by CPAN, which is where I had most of my history and working up into this time in the Perl community. Uh, all the data lives in the meta.json file that gets put into archives that are uploaded to PGXN. And this is the sole requirement to publish on PGXN. There are some non-extension-y things that are actually published on PGXN that have a meta.json file so that they can live there. Uh, all the other data that it uses in its APIs and uh, whatnot is derived from the system. <clears throat> so a meta spec looks uh, like this. This is an example from kind of a, a throwaway data type I wrote early on in PGXN just to kind of demonstrate how it all works. You just have the name of the extent of the distribution you're sending out and the version of it. And these two things together comp, uh, comprise the release. So this is release of pair 0 0.1.8. There's, of course, the typical uh, boilerplate for distributing stuff on the internet, uh, descriptions of what it is, uh, name and email address of the person or people who are maintaining it, the license information. <clears throat> the provides block here lists the extensions that are actually in the distribution. So this distribution has one extension, it has the same name as the distribution itself, it's pair. It's done this way because you can actually upload a distribution that has multiple extensions in it. Uh, and so it just has a, an abstract and um, documentation file, if there is one, and the version for the extension, which can be different from the version of the distribution. As you can see here, this is 012, whereas the distribution itself is 018. That's because there have been multiple releases uh, without actually changing the version of the extension itself. <clears throat> There's a prerequisite session where you can set the runtime dependencies. There's also build time dependencies and developer dependencies. You can specify Postgres itself, the minimum version you support. You can also specify additional extensions that you depend on. <clears throat> There's a block for resources. This is metadata about where to find it, how to file bugs, uh, metadata about the meta file itself, where it comes from, who generated this one. And then tags is a list of uh, tags you can associate with your extension when you're uploading. So that's it for the uh, meta spec. There are other additional fields, but that gives you the flavor for most of it. <clears throat> so the manager is the service that manages the network as kind of the root bit of it. Uh, it manages the extension distributions and Users can log in, create accounts. They can release extensions there. They own ones they released first. They can grant permissions to others to uh, also distribute them or to take over ownership. It enforces unique names. So it's a case insensitive, unique uh, constraint on the index in the database. And this is the global unique uh, identifier for extension names throughout uh, the, the, post, the Postgres. Well, I didn't say Postgres universe, but this is just within PGXN itself, of course. <clears throat> it just uses basic auth and a really dead simple API. Uh, it's effectively just a uh, model view controller application that has a usable publish uh, API, for example. <clears throat> this is the most complicated component of the entire architecture. And it's not just because of the user authentication, although identity certainly adds a wrinkle. 
it's more because by it being complex and doing most of the work to uh, determine what's in extensions and making sure they're uh, valid and all that, other parts of the system can be much, much simpler because they can just depend on it. Yeah, Ian. Um, I have a question about uh, the meta spec, if you don't mind. No, um, go ahead. Um, related to versioning. So um, you mentioned the, um, I forget exactly what you called it, but like the release has its own version and then the extension can have a diff different version. They could mm -hmm. be the same, but they could very well be different. Um, I've noticed that... Uh, you and I have also chatted on the side about how you enforce Semver um, yes. for, for those as well. And I've noticed that some extensions have versions like 1.2 yes. not 1.2.0. So if, in those cases, would you enforce the user to um, add it in the meta spec as 1.2.0? Yes, they have to do 1.2.0 in the meta spec, but they can still do 1.2 in their control file. Okay, cool. Thank you. It is not, the PGXN is not control file aware. It completely ignores it. So whatever they put in there is, it's fine. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, quick question. Um, can you like compare and contrast uh, how PGXN thinks about an extension versus a distribution and like what is a release? An extension? The basic idea of an extension is that thing you can you run create extension name and that's what the extension is, right? The thing that you can actually bundle and install. A distribution is a tarball or zip file that contains that extension and may contain other extensions. Uh, I took this in, you know apart from uh, Perl modules on CPAN where I would upload a release and it would have a whole bunch of different packages in it, but it would have, just have one release name. <clears throat> And they're actually, PGTAP actually supports this where PGTAP comes with three extensions uh, in a single release. One is a simpler one extension that you can use that uh, contains just a subset of the tests and the other one has more complicated stuff. And then a uh, release is just uh, a distribution name plus the version number, which is basically just the thing you've uploaded to release it onto the network. Hang on a second, I gotta get like, the cat in the room. Come on. Yeah. It's their world. We just live in it. <clears throat> does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Steven. Hey, um, so I have two questions. So one question <laughs> is about like if somebody had, because we've seen extensions that have the same name, like Columnar, for example, and yeah. um, or like they or mismatching so that and then also mismatching between like the distribution name and the extension name like, yes cause some hassle for us and then um yeah so th that was the first question and the second question was about um does it does pgxn handle extensions that are like technically modules like you don't use create extension for example auto explain yeah so uh auto explain comes with postgres itself doesn't it um, I'm not sure, but just yeah, I can't, I can't loadable, like loadable libraries that don't use the create extension framework, but I guess you could call them an extension. PGXN really cares about only one thing, the meta.json file. You can put complete garbage in your package and it will not care. Now, if extensions have duplicate names, only one person can own the name. The first person to upload something to the network owns that name unless they transfer ownership to someone else. So if somebody else creates something with the same name, if they want to distribute it on PGXN, they'd have to give it a different name or get with the other person to merge their, their work or whatever. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, dead simple website, and you can just uh, submit your archive with the meta.json here. That's how you, you do the release. <laughs> so let's talk about how the publishing works when you make that upload. Uh, the PGXM manager first, it extracts the uploaded archive, which can be any a number of archive formats, you know, tarball or whatever. Uh, it will convert it to a zip file if it's not already a zip file, because its rule is everything we distribute is zip files. And that allows the client to be simpler. The client only has to worry about one format, any clients. It will also ensure that the uh, uses a name dash version prefix so that when you unzip it, it unzips into a folder with name, name dash version. 
just as a standard way to do it. I was thinking, as I was doing this, I was thinking about uh, how difficult it was to download things from SourceForge back in the day, where it would have a different name and random stuff, and you'd have to know what directory to change into. Here is like, it's the same directory name as the uh, released tarball itself, uh, zip file itself. It validates the meta.json file to make sure it's legit. And then it calls the SQL function in its database add distribution. And then it simply writes all the resulting files to the root mirror, which is just a file system. So let's talk about that add distribution function. Somebody sent something in chat. Oh yeah, it's just a link. <clears throat> so this function also validates the meta.json file. And then it adds the SHA-1 signature, the username as they logged into uh, PGXN and the date. They inject, it injects it into the meta.json. <clears throat> so that manager itself is the canonical authority for those things when you upload. It also checks the permissions to make sure that, you know, the person uploading the distribution has permission to uh, release that distribution and all of the extensions that are in it. And assuming they do, uh, let me to hide this window here, it inserts the record in the database um, that uh, has a trigger on it that uh, cues a notification message in using listen notify in Postgres. And then it returns the files to write. This function here and all the functions it depends on the database is where almost all the business logic is. It knows what all things need to be updated for the system. So the files that are updated include the meta.json itself, like because we put the SHA-1 in it, uh, the list of distribution releases, uh, a list of extension releases, releases that a user has made, releases that are associated with a tag, uh, recent releases, and summary stats. Uh, I'm realizing here I'm misusing releases in some of these things, extension distributions, whatever. No, actually there's a lot of releases. Anyway, so the database generates the JSON for all those files and tells and returns like, here's the name of the file, here's the contents that goes in the file, and then PGXM manager writes those out to the file system. Let's see here. I think I'm gonna do that blue code itself, which sounds like, yeah, this is a source code distribution system, Stephen. <clears throat> All right, so it all gets put on the root mirror. So then there's a consumer daemon that just consumes the, the queued messages for listen notify, uh, which can be for new releases, for a new user out of the system, new mirror, and it dispatches to handlers. This is an extensible system that right now just listens for new release messages and posts them to Mastodon and until a few months ago, Twitter. Uh, Twitter's gone because Twitter's gone. Uh, this is an extensible place where we can add other stuff. There's add webhooks. I've also had some challenges with the lack of persistence with listen notify stuff when restarts and things like that. It might be fun to put in PGMQ in here to uh, improve that situation. But then you can see announces of all the releases here on the PGXM Mastodon account on bots and space. And looks like PGM. Yeah, yes, that sounds right. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about the root mirror. This is simply a, a bunch of directories of JSON files. It's a fully static REST API all on its own. <clears throat> has the meta.json file, has the zip file. So I, when I said JSON files, I lied. It also has a zip file for releases, of course. Uh, it has the derived metadata we talked about, user releases, tag releases, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, it has at its root this index.json, which is kind of a directory of all the APIs and, and how to use them. Everything, because it's a static uh, file serving uh, service, there only, there's only get supported. And so this just maps, so if you want to do a download, you need to know, know the distribution name, the version, the distribution and the version, and you can get the zip file for it. You can do the same thing to get the readme, the meta, stuff like that. Actually, I was have a little things to call attention to it here I forgot about. You can get the readme and meta also for a release. Uh, you can get the list of uh, all the releases for a given ex extension, a distribution, or all the releases uh, for a given ex extension, right? 
There's uh, information about individual users, individual tags. So in these, like uh, the tembo.json is going to have information about the releases uh, that the tembo user has made. The tag is going to have a list of releases or a list of extensions, list of releases. I, I, distributions. Oh, I can't remember now. We'll look at it in a minute. <clears throat> uh, that are associated with that tag. Because remember, you put the tag into the meta file. And then there's basic stats for this thing. Uh, as well as a list of the other mirrors for the system, because people can mirror it, as I'll show you in a minute, and uh, the meta spec format itself. Uh, there's documentation for it, which is distributed as plain text and markdown in HTML, I think. So mirroring this thing is really easy. You just create your directory, and you rsync it like this. You just rsync it to master.pgxn.org. And then you can serve it, and you're ready to go. You Boom, you have a mirror for the entire system. Set up a cron job to uh, sync it whenever you want. Uh, there's actually a place on PGX Manager where you can register your mirror uh, <clears throat> and you know say how often it's updated and stuff like that. Currently, there are two mirrors. Uh, Dilevo runs one. I can't remember what the other one is. So just for this root mirror, it has these uh, APIs that you can call that are defined at index.json. Uh, I looked at that already. So we can always call it, like if I ran that um, Python command to serve static files, I can go to the dist, dot, the dist pair JSON, and this is what it looks like. This is for the distribution name pair. These are all the releases that were there, all the stable releases, I should say, that were there. So 017 was released in uh, 2020, 016 was released in 2018, and so on. In addition to stable, there are also testing and unstable. And these are also set in the meta.json file. So if you want to release something and not have it indexed and just you know be able to download it and uh, beta test it, you can. <clears throat> Under extension, extension.json, uh, for example, if we're going to get the pair.json to learn about the pair extension, here is the latest stable release for that. So this is how we know what the latest, latest stable release is. Uh, here's a list of the releases that contain version 0 0.1.2, right? Because as I said before, you can have the same version in multiple releases. And the reason for that is usually like you fixed some documentation, but it, no functionality has changed. Or like you fixed a bug in the installer script for a new version of Postgres, but it, you didn't change any of the functionality. So you might want to keep the version of the extension itself the same. And here's the list of all the releases that contained 011 back in uh, the early days. Uh, another API is to get the, the, the metadata file itself, the meta.json, which is almost the same as what you uploaded as part of your package. But as I said, the add distribution function will timestamp it and put your name in it and put the SHA-1 signature for the zip file into it. User.json, this is uh, information about the user and a list of all the releases that the user has made. So this is a release of JSON. Is JSON valid? There's a stable release in 2017. Similarly for tags, this is a tag for the messaging.json. It has two, uh, two looks like it has two uh, distributions that are associated with the messages messaging tag, one is PG message queue and the other is PGMQ, which makes sense. And this is just a list of all the versions of that, of that distribution that are associated with that. Yeah, that's what I said. So let's have a quick demo of that. All right, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sync a mirror that I have here locally. Unless somebody's asking something here. <laughs> Um, I think OmniTI wrote the other one. So I'm going to rsync it here. I'm doing something a little different here so we can see the changes. So this is a live rsync I'm making. Oh, there was some stuff here that was funky. Uh, but let's see here. Uh, no such file or directory. That's annoying. Hang on, I'm going to do this again. I need to... Go here. That's better. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see since it was last synced, there's been a release of PG Lighter. It's a new distribution, new release here and all the files that were there. Uh, the information about it as an extension. Um, <clears throat> the stats were all updated because of that release. These tags, async later and PGMQ were all tags in that. And so they were added. And of course the user tembo.json was changed because there is a new release made by that user done just this morning. So we can just start a static file server here and just use the Python stuff. And that's it. Now we have a running mirror. So let's see what it looks like. Uh, I'm going to make some requests to it. I had some in the slides here, but we'll do some live ones here. Just to get the sat summary stats, we can see there are 351 distributions and 375 extensions that are on the system currently and two mirrors. If we look at the distribution stuff, we can scroll up here and see that the most recent one was PG later. And they're in reverse chronological order. So you can see that a few days ago, there was PGMQ. This is the 56 most recent ones. And that's used to populate that column uh, on the right on the PGXN homepage. Um, what about the tag stats? This just shows you that there are 815 tags. And these are the 56 most used. There are 26 distributions with uh, FDW, 23 with foreign data wrapper, 17 with function, and so on. Same with user stats. These are the 56 most active users. There are 418 users. The most active is Thomas Vondra, who's done 90 releases. Nasby's done 70. Chris Travers has done 33 and so on. That's it. But for now, let's go back to the slides. Uh, let me let's see the other questions here. Oh, I'm sorry, Ian. Uh, all right. So the search API. No, you missed that uh, the cool slide. See all the moving glowy stuff, lava lamp. Anyway, <clears throat> the search API fundamentally at its root is just another mirror. But what it does is it syncs every five minutes and it goes over the rsync log to look for any changes that have been made, not dissimilar to the output we just saw when I did the sync from upstream. And it transforms things to make changes to add additional APIs over and above those static APIs that ship with every mirror. So uh, it has no database underneath it. It is, in the end, just files on the file system as well. There's no other service it depends on. So let's say we've done a release. We've done a release of PG later, for example. Here's what uh, API uh, service does when it runs a sync every five minutes and it sees there's a new release. It's going to validate the checksum for it by looking at SHA-1 from the meta file. And it unpacks the zip file. And it extends the meta.json with additional data, including like a list of the doc files that are associated with the release, special files like changes and readme uh, information, uh, the release history for the distribution. And then it also will update older release histories. So it'll go back to older releases of the same distribution and update their lists. Uh, of releases so that it knows there's newer ones. And it does the same thing for the tag and user JSON. It extends them by adding release abstracts. And for um, the ex uh, extension JSON, it also adds a list of doc files that are associated with the extension and release dates. All this is to power um, what gets displayed on the website, which I'll show you in a bit. It also trolls through and looks for likely documentation files. Uh, and it generates HTML for them, uh, which it cleans up. It prevents a lot of junk from getting in. It's very picky. And then it saves them again on the file system for the API to use. I use a, a module I wrote called Text Markup that supports a whole bunch of different formats. So different people can upload things using whatever documentation format they, they like. It recognizes each one and generates the appropriate HTML. Then there's the full text indexing. It indexes, it uses uh, a, uh, a library called Apache Lucy, which is sort of a loose Lucene port. I noticed that unfortunately Apache Lucy was discontinued in 2018, so a little behind the times here on the system, but everything continues to work. Uh, Apache Lucy uses local index files, basically Lucene style indexes, but they're just the raw files on the file system. So there's no separate service. There's no Elasticsearch or Solar or anything like that. 
This allows it to be extremely fast and very distributed. And it indexes, you no, know, go back. It, that's what happens when I hit the button twice. It indexes distributions, extensions, users, tags, and documentation by taking those HTML generated docs and indexing those whole, those whole things, those suckers. <clears throat> uh, then it updates the user list, which is an additional uh, API it provides that's not uh, in every mirror. And it just indexed by first letter and list each username. This is what it looks like if I make a curl to the API for the letter Q. This shows me all the users that start with the letter Q. This is basically there solely so that um, there will be links to all the users on the site and like search engines will be able to uh, find them and index them. Otherwise they would just be, because uh, a lot of, there are a bunch of users that have no extensions, so there'd be no links to them. So, like the mirror, it has its own index.json file and it adds these additional APIs to it. So there's the letter, the user letter.json I just described is, is appended to it. There's the HTML doc one, which allows you to fetch those HTML files that it generates for documentation. So there's the distribution and the version and then the path to the document that was generated. There's the search API itself, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. And the source, because as I said, it unpacks the, the zip file <clears throat> and puts in a file system that allows you to browse it. So recall then that the, the distribution uh, .json, so like uh, this would be pair.json, just has a list of releases, stable, unstable, and uh, testing. The API uh, adds a bunch of stuff to that. So if we fetch the pair.json file from API, we can see a lot of other stuff. Effectively, what it does is it merges in almost everything that's in the meta JSON into this file. Uh, this is done so that the, um, the site, when it's serving things, can make fewer web requests in order to show stuff. It's just all right here for like the home page for this particular distribution. It also adds a list of the docs so that you can have a list of the docs, the special files that are associated with it. Um, all that is what appears on the homepage for distribution. The doc path, the documentation path. So having looked at that previous, um, the previous API call, we saw that there was uh, a doc named uh, doc slash pair.html. So now we can actually use the doc API to fetch that and it will return the HTML for that, including a table of contents that it put in. And this is this one is generated from from a markdown file, and as I said, it can support any number of different markup languages. The extension JSON, it this this is the same as before, where they had the distribution name and the SHA one and version, but it adds the abstract and the doc path again for help with display. And similarly, uh, for actually browsing the source for stuff, this is just static files. So it just serves this up as static files that you can then browse from your web browser to see what's in it to explore. Then there's the search engine API, uh, where you search by in is one of the indexes. There's, as I said, there's documentation, extension, distribution, tags, and users, which is way too many. But here we can search for all extensions for the for the term pair for the query pair, and this returns a, a result that has the name the query and the number of results that are in the query. Uh, there's also a limit and an offset. So if I set a limit of one, there would be only one record in here, and I'd be able to paginate to go to the next one by making an additional call to uh, limit by changing limit and offset. For each of the hits, it should they are listed in reverse order by the score that's determined by Lucy. Uh, so here we see this extension pair has a score of 3.691 and the unnest ordinality has a score of 0 0.14. And that's just all the uh, full text indexing magic for scoring particular terms within documents. It also injects the excerpt or the first excerpt in which it finds a term so you can find here that um, because it's weighted abstract, I think heavier than like full text of a, of a document, this gets a higher score and it finds this right in that abstract and it highlights it with a strong tag so it can just, just be displayed. 
Uh, here, this is pulled in from a different part, maybe of the description of the unannounced ordinality, where there's the term pairs right at the end. And you can see there that it's pairs, not pair, because it's using, um, I think, a snowball style. Um, God, now I'm reaching way back in time. It, it's doing an analysis of just the, the roots. It's, it's, it's searching for pair, and so it'll find pairs and pairing and stuff like that. So all the docs for the static mirrors and for the api.pgxn.org are on the PGXN API wiki. Uh, <clears throat> I think this predates open API because I hand wrote all those docs for all these APIs. <laughs> so it's been kind of fun to look through them in the last week and, and see uh, how good they are or not. But there's way more in there and you're, you're welcome to take a look. Any questions about the API service? Right. All right, let's talk about the site. This is really just a very thin layer over the API. It, you just give it the URL for the API, which is a read-only API. There's no authentication or anything like that. It's only gets. Uh, and mostly static, so it can be very, very fast. So to run it, all you do is start the server and you tell it, here's the API to use, and here's the base URL to use for, for links that you provide in the site itself. And it just does the whole thing. So I can show you what that looks like as well. So I'm gonna start the server here. There. It should be started and we can see what it looks like. Uh, oh, you know what? I didn't share the browser window. Hang on a second. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share again. And I guess like this, this, no, this, this, and this, there we go. So now can you see the browser window? Yes. Excellent. So this you can see is just running on localhost. Zoom getting in the way. Uh, just running on localhost port 5000, but it's pointing to the live API. So you can see PG later is here because the API indexed it earlier and our synced it just like we are synced our local mirror. So we can look at it and see what it looks like. Uh, there it all is. These are the special files. So remember, we updated the uh, PG later .json with additional data and that way this um, this page is displayed basically with a single uh, API call to the API because it has all this information so it can show it. Oh, and then there's a second API call to embed the, the readme, uh, which I need to update the parser to actually handle fences. <clears throat> uh, and you can see it picked up the contributing file as additional documentation and indexed it. So it's using the fetch of the HTML for this file because it knows the path in order to show embed the HTML for it. What else we got here? Tembo now has a list of a couple of um, extensions. We go back here. Uh, what else do we want to say? Users, you can say Tim. Oh, no, I'm just going to hit T. There's Tembo, right? So all this is, I'm running this locally, but as I said, it's relying entirely on the API to do, to do stuff. So it's a pretty clean separation of the presentation of the site itself from the API as independent services. Right. So back to this. Any questions about the uh, site or the uh, API or any of that stuff? All your questions were about the meta spec. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the command line client. <clears throat> uh, the command line client was something that I had in, was in the cards and in my plan to write when I did this whole thing back in 2010, 11. Uh, but Danielle, Daniele uh, Barazzo beat me to it and wrote a very nice command line client in Python, which was super fun because I never write Python. So it's fun to see somebody else uh, being able to take the API and just run with it to be able to do all the things we needed to do. 
It has git like commands for install, uninstall, search, mirroring, and there's more. Uh, it is extensible, so you can add new commands to it by writing them in Python or even writing them in another language and just putting your executables in the appropriate directory. So here's an example. If we use the PGXN clients to search for uh, extensions named uh, pair, we get back, see, it, first it does this uh, request to the index.json, so it knows uh, what path... Um, what pattern to use to make the API call and fill in the uh, URI uh, templates that are in there. And using that, it, it assembles the search query and executes it. And it gets back the two results, pair and unnest ordinality, just like we saw when we called the JSON ourselves. Uh, it also has code that it's taking that, that response where it had strong tags around those stuff in the abstract and uh, the client actually changes them to be emphasized by the stars, which is pretty cool. The install um, command, you can point it at different clusters by pointing at different PG configs. So I'm going to say install pair using this particular PG config file. And what it does is it uh, makes the call to the system to say, what is the best version of pair? So it calls the pair.json in order to find that out. And it says, oh, it's 017, that's the latest. So it then, using that, it knows where to go to make the API call to get the download file, the zip file, and downloads it. And it unpacks it, knows how to unzip it, and it runs configure and make install. Or in this case, just make and make and make install because there's no configure file. It, so the configure file is optional. Now I have to let the cat out one sec. Go on. All right. <clears throat> so it's assuming basically the, the standard patterns for um, uh, Postgres uh, release uh, releases of extensions using the whole Postgres extension uh, build mechanism using PG config and all that. But as I said, there are other uh, things that are on PGXN that PGXN client knows how to install that don't do that. So for example, there's um, PG top, I think, which is um, a, uh, a utility that's just running the command line that Mark uh, Wong wrote for uh, looking at the performance of your Postgres um, uh, processes, just like top. So it's not an extension. It's not something that gets loaded along with Postgres itself. It's just utility. Well, that's in there. It has a make file, so it's able to able to build it and do it. The PGX load command, uh, load command, on the other hand, assumes there's an extension. And what it does is it connects to the database. It determines what the best version is, and it, it runs create extension on the database. And having done that, because I just installed it on the last slide, I can connect to the database and actually use the pair uh, extension because it's been installed in there. And I believe there are options to install it in specific schemas and stuff like that for relocatable uh, extensions. Now, in addition to PGXN client, there's another client called PGXN utils. These contains development utilities to help you develop and maintain your extensions. It's by Dixon Guedes. Uh, it is a Ruby application. So as I said, you can write them in whatever languages. It uses the upload API for the management service, manage, uh, for PGXN manager in order to let you do releases. But it extends the PGXN client that Daniela wrote uh, with additional commands. There's skeleton, which is like init to create a new, a new extension project. Uh, there's change, because if you want to make changes to the metadata, to the meta.json or the control file, I believe. <clears throat> there's bundle, it knows how to package it up for release on PGXN, and then actually release command to release something like that. Uh, so this uh, needs a little TLC. It hasn't been updated in a while. Uh, I couldn't get it running with Ruby 3 this week, um, but uh, hopefully and Dixon will, uh, We'll pick up uh, some of the stuff and make some improvements. It's been a while. But this is the sort of stuff it provides. The skeleton command allows you to create a scaffolding for your uh, extension. It has a number of different templates that you can use. There's C, Foreign Data Wrapper, and SQL, and maybe one other. I can't remember. So let's say we want to create a Foreign Data Wrapper just for the PGXN API. Uh, so we can say, create a skeleton, uh, use Git to create a first commit use the foreign data wrapper template and give it a name. And it creates everything it needs, the control file, uh, a git ignore file. 
it creates the uh, scaffolding for the meta.json that you need for releasing on PGXN. It creates the pgconfig standard uh, make file to use in a readme file. And then it uses the PGXN recommended data structure for where to put your files. So some markdown in the doc directory, the SQL used to uh, install it in the SQL directory, uh, the source code, your C source code in the source directory and test in the test directory. And here it's also uh, initializing the git repository and commit it, make it a first commit all in this one command. The change command, uh, you can tell it the change. Um, here I'm changing the maintainer and the license. So it will show you a diff of a change it tried to make. And you can tell it, yes, go ahead and make it. And it will change that metadata for you. Uh, there's the uh, release process where you can tell it to bundle your, your distribution. And so it'll just create the zip file for you with the appropriate version number. Uh, and then if you release it, it's gonna prompt you for your username and password and then send it off to PGXN for release and distribution on the network. Now some comments, let's see here. How does PGX sense, uh, may I go back a bit? Doesn't touch inside Postgres features yet, like enabling extension. Yeah, yeah, that's just something that, that uh, Danielle put in a CLI. Um, how does PGX sense support extensions that don't use PGX access, like extensions with PGRX or Etsy? So the PGXN client, I don't believe is PGRX aware. There's been some uh, talk about it a little bit, and I think Dan Danielle has heard about it. Um, but I don't know that he's had the opportunity to look into it. Basically, though, if you have a make file in there and you can do make install, uh, make and make install, it'll work. So you can fake it out by putting a make file that does all the PGRX stuff. Uh, but it won't, you know, have installed PGRX from Cargo. It won't install Cargo or any of that stuff. You would need to have that in place. So it's doable. Is there some notion of declaring system dependencies? There is not. That's one thing that one of the top things on my list to fix for binary distribution in particular. So yeah, if you want to install something like a, uh, there's an AMQP extension, I think, like you need an AMQP library in order to use it. And you need to look at the readme in order to do that. <clears throat> Uh, so, and that again is basically because PGXM was designed first and foremost, its job, the thing it was trying to solve was, um, single source of record for all extensions, uh, discoverability, uh, good documentation, and the ability to download it and use the standard, uh, download it and then do your own thing to install it. So once you download it, it's like, it's out of our hands and the PGXM client, the stuff that's in there, the stuff that Daniel wrote, just assuming the Postgres extension stuff or just the make file stuff. Um, but the, I think that there's a lot of room for saying, okay, let's really look at what's needed to support binary distribution where like uh, what I'm imagining is something like a, a new service that our syncs from PGXN or, for, or uh, gets a, a webhook call or something like that, that gets to all the new releases and it can look in the meta files and see what the dependencies are and automatically generate your RPM spec file, your app spec file, and build all the binaries that you need for all the platforms you support and stuff like that. That's uh, something I talked to some folks about, uh, like Robert, way back in the day, but uh, I would have had to, to do it. Yeah, trunk is binary distribution. Right. Yeah. Yeah, our, the PGXN is like, here's where to get it. And the README hopefully has decent ins installation instructions and you're on your own at that point. And that definitely is a problem we need to solve. Uh, never mind like supply chain security. <laughs> We're gonna need to get into it at some point. Uh, finally, I wanna talk a bit about the CICD tools. This is a Docker image that I wrote a couple of years ago uh, that allows you to uh, run any version of Postgres from 8.2 through the latest, through uh, what's, what's in uh, main, I think. I think they still call it master in the project. It has a number of utilities that come in the image, including the PGXN client that Danielle wrote. So if you want to, you need to install other dependencies, you easily can. Uh, there's pgprove, which is um, the uh, command line client for running pgtap tests. 
which is different than the tap tests that come with Postgres itself. If you wrote PG tap test for your project, that you can use that, which I do in some places. Um, it has various scripts to help you do regular tasks, like start the version of Postgres you want to build and test your extension, to bundle it up, and of course, to release it. So not dissimilar to a couple of the things that are in the uh, uh, PGXN utils client. So here are a couple of examples. Here's like a continuous integration uh, GitHub workflow where you can say, okay, here are all the versions of Postgres I want to test it on. So for each one of those, uh, we're going to run the PGXN utils PGXN tools <laughs> container image. And you say, okay, here's the version of Postgres to start. And it uses um, the uh, Postgres community's app repository to start up any version that you specify that it supports, which goes back a long way. You clone the repo and then you tell it to test just by running the PG build test script, which is a relatively short uh, shell script that runs make all, make install, make install check for your extension. If your extension doesn't support those things, you would you know, need to just put in different run command here. But the nice thing is that you can set up to do all sorts of versions of, of Postgres uh, to, to search stuff. And I thought it was kind of fun that um, the, um, the Python Postgres driver test suite now uses this. Uh, that's Danielle as well. He uses the PGXN tools in order to test the Python uh, Postgres driver on all versions of Postgres that supports. Uh, so with this, like you can say, oh, here's, you know, all the versions of Postgres that uh, we've tested for this particular thing. And this is actually a screenshot from testing uh, the PGXN utils, uh, PGXN tools image itself. It also support a release workflow, some of which, uh, which some of you have seen as I've been adding them to uh, our extensions. You could say, okay, when there's a tag push that looks like a, uh, a, um, <clears throat> sorry, a semantic version. We're going to um, bundle the release, which basically validates the metadata file. And then it runs git archive in order to archive the, to create a zip archive of it. You give it your PGXN username and password, which you need to put in secrets in your repository or in your organization. And I have done this for our organization for the Tembo username. And then you call pgxn release, which is a shell script that does some checking and other things to make sure things look good. And then basically it just calls curl to the pgxn manager upload uh, since it's a um, uh, basic authentication header and uploads the file. And that's how we can automate releases through workflows. And we do, as I said, the consumer can pick it up and it posts a message to um, to Mastodon. Uh, fun thing about the Mastodon uh, API, you can tell it to delay publishing a message for some time. And because the API syncs only every five minutes, I just have it delay posting this message for five minutes. So it should be that anytime this publishes, you click the link and it will work. This was a problem for a long time. People would say, the link doesn't work. I'm like, wait a few minutes. It hasn't synced yet because it would post immediately to Twitter. But now it posts... Uh, five minutes later on, on uh, bots in space. And uh, this is what it looks like. It randomly selects a uh, emoji to put on there. Anyway, I'm rambling now. It's, it, was, it was fun to implement this last year. It's one of the bigger things I've done with PGX in a while. So that's basically the architecture for PGXN. I hope you enjoyed the show. I am more than happy to take all of your questions. Well, not totally random. I have a list of acceptable ones and it randomly chooses from those lists. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it'd be the poop emoji or something. <laughs> Do you mind sharing the slides with us later on? No, not at all. Cool. Of course. What questions have you got for me? Do you know anybody who uses uh, PGXN like a, a live hosted service to install extensions? What do you mean a live hosted service? You know, like uh, Big Animal or something like that. What is Big Animal? The, like EDB's hosted Postgres service. I mean, like a Postgres as a service provider. 
Uh, I don't, I don't. Yeah, they could be, they wouldn't have told me. So among the key design decisions that I made early on was to make this thing as simple and dumb as possible. So for example, although you can do um, callback kind of things with JSON with the API, which was a fun way to like make a little box on your blog that shows your recent releases or something like that. <clears throat> There's not much interactivity. You can just statically fetch things. So there are no stats. I don't know how many times things were downloaded. I don't know whether anything was downloaded at all. Um, people can be rsyncing and I'm paying no attention to the rsync log. So I have no idea who's rsyncing to it and hasn't registered as a mirror. <clears throat> It's just out there to be used as a as a resource. Right. And, okay. and, and you know, uh, like the, the the main site itself uh, uses no JavaScript, for example. It's just entirely static HTML generated from the API calls. Simple, 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 simple. Ian. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the features that you and community users think are awesome and what are the things that you're looking forward to improving? Um, it's awesome that it's there. It has predictable URLs. Uh, the documentation generation is decent, although not enough people take advantage of it. The number one thing that needs to be updated is the, the search API. And in the last couple of years, I've done a bunch of work to kind of update things. I like made the site mobile friendly, for example. And I added the um, queue-based uh, messaging stuff, <coughs> the listen notify, I should say, messaging stuff for posting to Twitter and Mastodon. But I haven't touched the API service because <clears throat> Lucy is six years gone and continues to work. <clears throat> and I have long regretted that I have separate indexes for users and, and extensions and distributions. So sometimes people search for stuff and they can't find it because they haven't picked the right index to search from. Worse, uh, most extensions don't ship with any documentation other than a readme, and it doesn't currently index the readme as documentation. <laughs> it indexes the readme as part of the distribution. Uh, so that's a long standing thing. <laughs> so I think that the, the API system could use a lot of TLC. Uh, I think that the uh, um, the command line client could use a little TLC too, especially the uh, developer tools, which uh, have not seen much attention in like eight years or so. But I'm most excited for uh, stuff like um, making the kind of core API for the system more robust in terms of like, hey, an extension has been released. We can make a webhook call to something else so that something can be updated right away instead of having to rsync, you know, every five minutes or something like that. Uh, I think that there's, it's going to be really valuable and helpful to be able to extend the um, metadata to include binary dependencies, among other things. So that it would be easier for downstream systems like app.postgresql, rpm.postgresql, a trunk to spin up a service that just subscribes to that webhook, gets those information, and can build all the binaries it needs just based on what's on what's not in there. So hopefully reducing some of the burden of maintaining those things. Because right now what's in uh, apt and young Postgres repositories or whatever somebody had an itch to scratch and contributed. And then like then the project has to maintain it. <laughs> so yeah, if we can like make a lot of that thing go away, it'd be great. Well. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I found that they're relatively sparse as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an ongoing challenge. Um, but yeah, I think there's an opportunity to, to make things a lot more. Um, and this is really what I'm going for in the uh, kind of ecosystem doc I've been working on off and on for the last couple of weeks uh making a almost a, a mashup style APIs that people can use. So we can add things like metadata to things. And when I imagine like, let's actually have download stats for extensions. Well, what does that require to have it distributed? Because there are all these binary things. Well, if trunk is a trusted webhook subscriber, we can have trunk actually periodically send its upload stats and it can update them. So we can bring things back upstream too. 
So I think there's a lot of interesting things that we can do. And, and, and again, it doesn't necessarily <clears throat> have to be PGXN, but I think there's a lot of stuff here we can we can learn from and take advantage of, build on. For sure. I think there's like uh, so much more to PGXN um, than uh, that I've learned over the past, well, year really. Yeah. Um, than, uh, uh, than I realized at first, so. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was part of why I wanted to do this because I was realizing I think there's a lot here that people don't even know about. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't know about the CLI. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's in homebrew. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know about it till uh, Adam mentioned it like many months after we had uh, <laughs> yeah. started. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> anyway, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any any other questions when we wind down? Or should I do the outro? All right. Well, thanks for uh, putting up with me and listening to my uh, my yammering on about PGXN. Uh, I hope you uh, learned something.